Dr. Larita Coleman-Brown is a retreat leader, speaker, spiritual companion, and professor emerita of psychology at Agnes Scott College. Professor Brown frequently speaks on contemplative spirituality and Howard Thurman. She's the author of the incredible book, What Makes You Come Alive? A Spiritual Walk with Howard Thurman, as well as When the Heart Speaks, Listen, Discovering Inner Wisdom. She's been featured in PBS documentaries about Howard Thurman and the Black Church. She lives in Stone Mountain, Georgia. And today, Professor Brown and I talk about the life, mysticism, and work of Howard Thurman, as well as his affinity for emperor penguins. We talk about the contemplative imagination and depth of Thurman, his trust of the spirit's activity, and what he called working papers. Something that I think can apply to all of us listening, because it really helps us understand what makes us come alive and help delineate how the spirit is working through that. Professor Brown has embodied the teachings of Howard Thurman and breathes them out in her own styling and language. More than once in this conversation, Professor Brown opened a window for me that I had thought I had painted shut. That is a rare gift in any conversation. You can visit Contemplify.com for the show notes on this episode and sign up for the monthly Contemplify non-required reading list, as well as the Lo-Fi and Hushed practice sessions. You can visit Professor Brown at LaritaColemanBrown.com. Now join me in raising a glass to my guest, Larita Coleman-Brown. Professor Brown, I'm so happy to be here with you right now and to talk about your wonderful work uh, and just who you are in the world. So thank you for being here on Contemplify. Well, thank you for the invitation. My pleasure. I want to start with a few questions, getting to know you and letting all those listening get to know you if they aren't already familiar with your work. But before I get into some of those questions about your own formation, I want to ask you kind of a, a bridge question between, between your book and also you. I'd love to get your take of what do you think that you can learn from a jack pine seed? Oh, it's so funny that you would ask that question because Howard Thurman has a meditation about the jack pine seed and how it takes an enormous amount of heat in, in order for it to be able to germinate. And uh, it's probably an indicative of my life and my own spiritual awakening. I have been through a lot of adversity, mostly physical, medical. And uh, I think many of those ordeals, many of those times in hospitals um, gave me an opportunity to connect with the presence in a different way. And uh, at the time, I, you know, I was, so, I was somewhat terrified by the experience, but as I reflect on it nearly, you know, 29 years later or so, uh, I understand that uh, it was definitely essential to my spiritual awakening. So uh, my my life is epitomized in a jack pine seed. <laughs> needed a lot of needed a lot of um, uh, a lot of adversity, a lot of uh, challenge in order for me to to actually produce a book like I did. So mm. mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah, you know, one of my favorite questions to ask is if someone were going to teach a class on the formation of Professor Larita Coleman Brown, what would be the three mandatory works? They could be readings, they could be art pieces, they could be places, but three mandatory works that formed you that would definitely be on that syllabus. Wow, <clears throat> that's a question. Uh, I think that um, definitely uh, 
in terms of places, it would be outside in nature. Uh, certainly I have been one who was drawn uh, to being outside because I found it most peaceful and serene. Uh, and uh, in terms of formation, other, other, other aspects of my formation, uh, I would probably also list uh, A Course in Miracles, which is a, a, a book that a lot of people probably are not familiar with and, and uh, uh, you know, a, a bit on the controversial side. Uh, and uh, think of one other uh, possibility. It's hard for me to select one other, uh, say, book on the syllabus. Perhaps um, journaling would be the mm. the other aspect. One of the things on the on the uh, syllabus that that it's so important to reflect on uh, life and on oneself and on one's spiritual journey. And uh, I certainly have been formed a lot from what I have, what has been revealed to me as I have journaled about the various uh, events, as well as the various books and movies and artwork, et cetera, that I've encountered during my time. That's fantastic. It's so clear from your work how deeply you embrace contemplative practices as a way of being in the world. I would, when did you start journaling? When did that become a part of your rhythm? I, I would say on a, at least on a regular basis, because I did some diary writing, as many teenagers do, of course. But I, uh, I would say that um, someone somewhere in my early 20s, I started journaling, and um, I continue. Uh, I'm not a daily uh, journaler, but uh, I believe that it's important to uh, record um, as well as to uh, engage with the kinds of um, activities or and or some some wisdom that I might have read somewhere or uh, a conversation that I might have had. Um, I, I just love to be able to, to uh, in the early mornings, really uh, think and reflect about uh, what's been, as I said, revealed to me and or uh, how it is that I'm thinking about uh, the world or um, the the spirits that journey with me and my family or in my neighborhood. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I, I started journaling probably um, sometime in college and have continued to do so. Okay. Yeah, I, I love the way that what I hear you saying is just as all of life, as you experience all of life, it all kind of meets you at the page, uh, whether it's film, whether it's uh, spiritual experiences that you are processing or in conversation with. Uh, and I think journaling is one of those things that doesn't get talked about enough as a spiritual practice because it it can seem to uh, self-focus. But you know, as you say in your book, uh, self-reflection and self-knowledge is one of the keys to the spiritual journey. Uh, are, what other practices help you help ground you in your own daily rhythm or weekly rhythm or whatever it might be? Are there pr other practices that, that you lean on? Absolutely. So <clears throat> I am a, uh, a person who loves to utilize, um, uh, the practice of morning pages from the book, uh, The Artist's Way. So um, on most days, um, I will sort of dump three pages of uh, free association or stream of consciousness 
on the page just to kind of clear my mind so that I can sit. Um, not that it always helps with the mind, <laughs> but uh, I've had a practice of, um, and I call it kind of quiet time with God or quiet time with the presence. Um, so ev- every day I will sit um, typically for about 30 minutes. Um, and and I don't necessarily set a timer for ten, for 30 minutes, but just um, will will uh, sit for a certain amount of time, but but usually I want it to be 30 minutes or more. Um, so that's one of my uh, practices. I also uh, like to go outside in the morning. And as I uh, often say to people, catch a bit of stillness. I am a stillness person. And I think there's something powerful about stillness. I think uh, it, stillness reminds me of whatever it is, whatever images that people have of God. I think that sort of quiet, deep, pulsating energy of stillness is um, what holds all things together. And so oftentimes um, I will go outside and whether it's to garden or to walk or just to sit down and just bask in the stillness. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to do, along with sitting in the wind when I uh, have a moment to do that. Uh, and uh, I typically um, will stop about 10 minutes before the hour. And uh, I have, at least I have a, I've set a reminder on or a alert on my phone to go off about 10 minutes before the hour. And I snooze it so that about, about the top of the hour, I will take a minute or two just to connect with the presence and to remind myself, sort of bring myself back um, to the, that same stillness that I think lives with all of lives within all of us, um, as a way to uh, pull myself out of the vortex of chaos. Which is <laughs> typically, what you know the world is kind of like, uh, and also as part of my practice is that I uh, watch minimal news. <laughs> and at least over the last few years, I have. Um, watched enough news to be able to know what's going on, but probably not much more than that. Um, because I know somebody will come tell me if it's really something important. Somehow or another, yeah. I will find out. But so I, um, I, I watch minimal news. Um, and uh, I uh, would love to continue to cultivate the practice of taking the same amount of time at night but I don't always make that nighttime yeah. sit, <laughs> uh, either because I fall asleep or uh, I have the habit of trying to do just one more thing before I uh-huh. go to bed. But I really would like to have um, at least some time in the evening to just spend some time with the presence again. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. It's so clear how your life is orientated around connection with presence. And I was really struck by what you said about sitting in the wind. I wonder if you could share a little bit about about that practice. Is it literally going into the, the, the headwind and, and feeling the embrace of the wind brushing across your, your, your body? Well, you know, I, that started when I was a little girl. I mean, I was probably about four, five, six, I don't know. Um, but I used to like, I, I grew up in Southern California, and of course we had the Santa Ana winds there, um, but it was always pretty um, mild temperatures. And so if I saw that it was a you know windy day or the leaves were moving on the trees, I would just run outside. And sometimes my mother would stop me and say, would you just put on a jacket or something? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, and I would just go sit and, you know, Neighbors and relatives would come by and they'd ask, what is she doing out there? And I wasn't doing anything. I was just enjoying uh, 
the wind. And I, I was so amazed later when I read that passage in the Bible about, you know, the spirit is like the wind. It's just sort of, you can't see it and it, you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. And I just thought, oh, wow. So, and of course, as, as a five-year-old or six-year-old, I didn't ever make that connection, but there was something very peaceful and mm-hmm. serene about sitting in the wind and just letting it sort of blow through and, you know, get a nice breeze. Uh, and so it was just a pastime for me. And so I've continued, you know, if, as long as it's not like, you know, freezing or uh, yeah. uh, the wind is, uh, it's dangerous to be out in the wind because we're like having, you know, uh, the the tail of a hurricane or, you know, part of a tornado. But uh, if I can catch a nice breeze, I'm I'm loving it. And, and, and like I said, there's something very peaceful um, and serene about, uh, you know, wind and breeze. And, you know, I, I sort of watch the trees um, and, um, you know, there's just so much that you can learn um, from just observing and uh, 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 being a part of that sense of nature. I know when I go on retreat, and I usually take one or two and sometimes possibly three silent retreats a year. Um, And one of the things that I like to do is to uh, just watch nature, you know, watch butterflies um, or, uh, you know, bees going from one flower to the next or ants, you know, building a a house somewhere. It's, It's just great sometimes to just stop. And uh, watch nature as it is all the time. You know, all of this stuff is going on out there. I mean, we're we're running around, you know, um, upset about this, that, or the other. And this sense of nature, these things, are just, they continue to go on every year without fail. What an image! I I'm enamored and resonate with your the way that you respect and also resound and connect with gusts of wind and the force of wind, the the invisible yet strong presence of it. And what you were just saying too about watching little critters or watch nature unfold as it will reminded me of this morning. I I have an eight-year-old daughter and I will walk her to meet up with some friends so she could walk the west the rest of the way to school with them. But we we the meeting place is right in front of a neighbor's garden. And like to watch you know, a bunch of eight-year-olds see bees sleeping inside of a sunflower and, and just yes. how excited they get. It, it is the most serene, calming, grounding practice I have watching children Im- discover natural rhythms in the world. And uh, I was just reminded of that as, as you were talking about your own practices and how so much of it is paying attention to what is unfolding before us, right? Like it's, there's so much there. And I, I love the way that you cultivate that sense of presence in the presence of presence uh, and, and how that exudes itself through the natural world. Uh, so it's, thank you for highlighting that. Yes. I, 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 you know, oftentimes I was, I taught at the university of Colorado in Boulder for 10 years and I, It was one of the most beautiful uh, settings for a campus. And I I was sad because so many students were racing from one place to the next and not seeing these beautiful, they called them the flat irons, but mountains right there in front of you. Um, So uh, I think a lot of times we get caught up in, you know, our crazy pace and we just miss so much um, of, of life by racing from one thing to the next. Yeah, well said, well said. Well, I'm so grateful for your presence here and for talking about your latest book, What Makes You Come Alive, A Spiritual Walk with Howard Thurman, a fellow nature lover and nature mystic like yourself. Um, I actually want to begin in that vein. Um, You talk about how Howard Thurman lauded emperor penguins. 
what was it about Emperor Penguins that Thurman was was so inspired by? You know, Thurman was always about community and about people working together. And I think his intrigue with Emperor Penguins had a lot to do with the fact that um, both males and females took care of um, the uh, the egg, um, that they took turns uh, searching for food and, uh, you know, keeping the egg warm. And it was just that idea that both parents were, uh, us, were working together to make sure that they brought this life into the world. Um, and so, uh, and he, I mean, he just, he liked that idea and, these penguins so much. He used to paint penguins. He used to actually, that was one of his. Oh, really? Thoughts. Yes. And so there are these paintings that he did of penguins. Um, and uh, so, yes. And I, I think then people started sending him penguins, you know, he became a collector of penguins. But uh, he, anywhere where he saw a, a harmonious um, connection, uh, whether it was a people or something happening in nature, it was just like a sign to him that there is this underlying oneness and this connection of all things. And uh, why can't we pay more attention to that and and learn from that for our, you know to make our lives um, more uh, peaceful and uh, joyful? So. Yes, he he liked the, the uh, interworkings of uh, penguin couples, particularly the uh, emperor emperor penguins. We have penguins now at our zoo here in New Mexico, and they are such beautiful creatures to watch. The way that they do relate to one another and just their their daily habits—it's uh, fa- fascinating. And you know, there's so much of how I understand Howard Thurman's kind of mystic presence and vision of the world is connected to nature, that that tree that held a special space for him in his childhood. And then also his use of rivers as metaphors for the journey. What, what do you think it was about those, <clears throat> per, that particular tree and rivers as a metaphor that, that spoke to Thurman's kind of groundedness in his own life. And then also his, using rivers as a teaching tool. What is it about the natural world that offered so much to him as a a places of expression? You know, in some ways, I think Thurman uh, was born a mystic. And I don't know if, you know, people become mystics over time or you're born a mystic, um, but definitely born a mystic and a contemplative. No, no doubt in my mind. And he, uh, uh, I think due to the fact that he lost his father at an early age, about seven years old, he found um, that uh, th- that nature kind of embraced him. Um, and uh, so he spent a lot of time outside. He, he, he was raised in Daytona Beach, Florida, so walking along the ocean or rowing up the Halifax River or uh, sitting in his backyard. Um, with his back against an oak tree, and for and he says that you know he he and the oak tree communicated with each other that he he felt like the oak tree understood him and that's where he took <clears throat> so many of his joys and his sorrows um, and you know in some ways uh, he felt quite terrorized by his environment which is not surprising he's being uh, uh, raised in the early 1900s in uh, uh, Jim Crow South, and uh, so was very much concerned that something was going to happen to him. Um, and he says, uh, so he turned inside to God, which he later learned was meditating. So he started meditating at about eight or nine years old uh, next to this oak tree. Um, and then he, of course, has lots of other commentary about oak trees and trees in general, particularly in terms of um, how they can bend in a storm um, and not necessarily break, um, how uh, rooted they were, 
uh, and uh, that he felt like that there was something in them that uh, was uh, able to withstand the sort of tempest, is the word he used, of, 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 of being outside in that kind of environment. But he felt like that there was something in him and all people that um, is rooted and uh, can withstand the tempest of life. Hmm. Um, and that he wanted people to be aware um, of that uh, rootedness. Likewise, uh, he had a fascination with rivers, and uh, he he had this this notion that um, all rivers were uh, really making their way back to the sea, uh, which, as far as he was concerned, symbolized the source with a capital S, um, and that uh, uh, they were also uh, ways to think about um, one's life, that sometimes even riverbanks are shaped by, um, you know, how much water is passing through uh, at any particular time. Um, And it was sort of a reminder of, you know, what is it that is is shaping us as we go along our spiritual journey? Um, And then he also felt like that there were times of drought um, in rivers, as well as times of overflowing in rivers, um, and that uh, these were all connected to, um, you know, in times of drought, perhaps maybe we needed to uh, uh, step back and, and look at what it is that perhaps maybe we could kind of let go of. Um, and in times of, um, of you know, flooding, to, to also think about, you know, how we are connected to the source um, and perhaps maybe uh, uh, also think about, you know, what it is that uh, may be overflowing. Mm. So he loved nature just in a way that I don't think I've ever seen anyone talk about it um, and, and, and in a really practical way, you know, in a way that any person could relate to if they were just to step outside. Um, and it's because he was, you know, some people might call him, at least I had in an earlier article, called him an ordinary mystic. He really wasn't an ordinary mystic, but he was a mystic who was not living in um, a cloistered community, in a religious yeah. community. So he was living among people. Um, and using his observations of things like nature and uh, people and uh, other other mystics, et cetera, to uh, help um, spark um, ideas about the presence in others. So, uh, and, you know, some people call him a nature mystic. I think for Thurman, he felt like um, there were different kinds of mystics. Um, and I'm not sure if he would have, first, I'm not even sure if he would, I don't think he ever called himself a mystic, um, but he, he clearly would fall, fall into that category. Um, but uh, he was also heavily influenced by the um, Quaker, you know, uh, tradition of mysticism. And so I think a lot of times people are not, not exposed to these various kinds of, of mystics. We sort of think mystic must be someone you know, again, in a religious or cloistered community, you were praying all day. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he wanted to uh, help us to understand that that's not the only model of mysticism uh, that's available. What a gift. And thank God he was doing that because I will sometimes, for myself, I'll be offended when uh, humans are compared to computers. Like, I feel like, you know, uh, I don't know. There's something that that takes away the mystery of uh, uh, the spiritual experience when I'm a humanist compared to a computer. And, but with Howard Thurman, his metaphors are always so natural. They're always embedded in the natural world that I take such joy knowing that my life is being compared to a river going back to the source or being rooted like a tree. And am I? It it, it 
helps me sense my own my own blossoming and becoming in that because of the metaphors allow for a richness in it and not some sort of square uh earth destroying concept uh and i just always find his metaphors are full, such full of fecundity and uh that is a gift that i think all great teachers have and when it's a mystic teacher like the the results are endless i'm i'm curious to to ask you about this this groundedness and this way in which thurman would turn towards this interior connection with the divine with mystery and he had such a deep appreciation for a sense of calling and for what was his to do and what was not his to do. And there is such a powerful, quiet strength in, in knowing how you are being called to serve. And I think just from some of the examples of Thurman's life that you go, you write so beautifully about, about being kind of the wisdom elder of the civil rights movement without being on the front lines per se to giving up an amazing position in a university to go start a church or a fellowship, uh, interfaith fellowship, like all of these things feel uniquely curated to what was his to do in the world. What are your thoughts on how one might follow that lead uh, from Howard Thurman and I think from yourself, from the way that you talk about your own practices with the, within uh, being a spiritual director, to, to listen to that that still quiet voice or to what Thurman called the sound of the genuine. How, how do you, what kind of guidance do you offer folks as they seek to hear that calling in their own life of what is theirs unique gift to do in service to the world? You know, it is challenging at times, even for myself, to uh, either hear that voice and not allow it to be overridden by our um, our own uh, uh, unconscious sort of uh, uh, issues and or uh, habits. But uh, Thurman, and he got you know he he actually wrote about this idea of inner authority and how important it is once one understands that they are um, a holy child of God, that um, they have a sense of agency. They can say yes or no to anything. And uh, he, I think, uh, became very clear that there were certain things that he was being called to do um, and was able to sort of silence all the criticism that he would get every time he made a decision that other people didn't like. Um, you know, and, and especially the, uh, about uh, not uh, marching during the civil rights movement, for example. Um, but he said that his, his calling, his, his role was to um, hold the spiritual space for those who were called to the street. Or called for that kind of work, but but that was not his calling. And I, it was, you know, in some ways, when I first read that, I realized that it gives it gave me a sense of freedom, in some way, to be able to say no um, uh, to certain things that people may or may not want me to do. I think I've always sort of felt that in some ways, but I, I know that. Uh, like many of us, we are brought up uh, to be concerned about what other people think. So, you know, that's typically one of my overrides, as I call it. I call them overrides from sort of like an override of the guidance that you're getting from the spirit, from the still small yeah. voice. Uh, but Thurman became very adept at uh, following that uh that inner sense, um, and 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 there's a great story uh, about him when he was uh, being uh, recruited for uh, Boston University. Uh, the president kept calling him, saying, "Well, have you made a decision? Have you made a decision?" And he would say, "Well, I'm waiting for a word in my heart." Mm. So he was not going to allow anybody to rush him or to. Uh, um, uh, to to move him in some way that he was did not feel like that was part of his calling, but I I have to also say that Thurman had a good 
solid grounding uh, that he got really from his grandmother and his mother. You know, a sense of, you know, from his mother that he was always going to be cared for by God and from his grandmother that he was a holy child of God. Um, and when that becomes the uh, the source of your identity, as opposed to what other people are saying about you, um, that puts you in a whole nother territory. Uh, so I do believe that uh, he had a gift of being able to hear and to uh, connect with the presence, probably a, even more so than many people, but uh, to also execute that and uh, to stand like the tree, you know, grounded in what he knew um, and what he believed. Uh, so uh, I, 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 th I think for the rest of us, it's really like a practice. It can become a spiritual practice. So if somebody asks you to do something, um, I often share with my, the people that I meet with in Spiritual Direction Companion um, that sometimes you need to, to take a pause and consult with the Spirit. Now, in my own life, you know, I have, um, I, I call it putting out a question. I have put out several questions to the Spirit about, well, what should I do about this or, you know, et cetera. And I usually get an answer. But the problem is that most people don't want an answer, which is why they don't put the question out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they sort of want to do what they want to do, so they're not going to put the question out there and get an answer that they don't want to hear. And sometimes the answer is, yes, you must have this heart transplant, <laughs> or yes, you need to move to Minnesota, whatever it is. You know, so so a lot of people won't put the question out there, but I have done that and have gotten an answer, and I had to live live through the answer. Um, so uh, he, uh, I think he had a similar approach. He would put the question out there, um, and sometimes you know the the uh, answer was yes, and sometimes the answer was no. I we certainly don't want to hear no if it's something we want to do. <laughs> right. Yeah. We really love a good rubber stamping spirit that, that just rubber stamps yes. what we what we have said and put out to the world. Yeah, well, I'm gonna do this. Uh that's fantastic. And you know, you talked about Thurman's sense of inner authority. Uh and I'm reminded of that story where he has a vision after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was stabbed to go speak to Dr. King. Mm -hmm. And the confidence to follow through on a vision like like that, I think is common and uncommon. You know, I, I don't think everyone talks about uh, about that. But the when I think about the results of Howard Thurman going to talk to Dr. King and not, and encouraging him to take more space and what unfolds from that experience, it is staggering for the what what became of that i wonder if you could relay that story and any sort of grace notes you want to add along to that but it's such a powerful story to me yes yeah, so uh in 1958 um dr martin luther king was uh, uh engaged in a book signing in uh harlem and a woman uh, a mentally ill woman uh stabbed him and so uh Howard Thurman started having these visions of him, you know, sort of these, this, and this is, this vision thing had happened before uh, with his uh, sister many years prior to that, um, getting visions of his sister and later finding out that she was ill kind of thing. So in this case, um, he had a vision. And so he told his wife, he says, look, I got to go talk to him, um, <clears throat> find him and talk to him. And he found him in Harlem Hospital. And he went to him and he said, you know, I know that you've started this movement, but I think this movement has taken on a life of its own. Um, and I would hope that as you recover, that you will take some additional time for some silence and some solitude so that you will know what it is, is that is your role in this um, and it is said that it's one of the few times that um, 
Dr. King actually took any time off. Mm. Um, and so he took some some extra time. And um, it was then after then that he went to India to study nonviolence and to put a um, a wreath at the grave of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, who had already passed away. Um, and uh, it it is extraordinary. There are these just these moments when you realize that, um, and you know, I have a, a chapter on what I call sacred synchronicities, but you know, like these things being in place for the next thing to happen. Um, so you wonder, would we have had Martin Luther King and this form of the movement had we not had Howard Thurman? So let me just back up for a second um, yeah. and just add a little bit more to this. So um, Howard Thurman's uh, second wife, his first wife died um, from tuberculosis, but his second wife, Sue Bailey Thurman, and Alberta King, who was the mother of Martin Luther King Jr., were roommates in high school. And it makes you wonder whether or not the spirit was work long be- at work long before there was a Martin Luther King Jr. Mm-hmm. So you've got these two women that know each other. Um, and uh, we know that when the Thurmans came back from India uh, and, and after meeting with Gandhi in, 19, in, the 19, um, thir- in 1936, that one of their first stops was to have dinner with the Kings. And Martin Luther King Jr. would have been probably about seven years old at the time. We don't know whether or not he was at the dinner or what. But certainly the Thurmans shared their excitement about, you know, the sort of utilizing those uh, nonviolent, uh, the, the nonviolent philosophy in the movement here. And then we also know, though, that um, Howard Thurman uh, was writing and speaking about Jesus as a leader of a nonviolent religion as early as the late 1920s, early 30s. And so uh, he, he was thinking about this sort of nonviolence. Then he gets invited to go to India, um, and then he talks it, talks it over with Gandhi, and then he brings back all of that excitement with him um, back to the United States. Um, and, uh, but we know formally that um, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, met Howard Thurman on the pages of his classic book, which I believe every person should read, yes. Jesus and the Disinherited. It's like, don't let the title turn you off. It's just an extraordinary <laughs> book. Yes. Um, and uh, he uh, and wrote a paper on it, by the way, in seminary. And then, of course, they crossed over at Boston University. And um, Dr. King also uh listened to many sermons that Thurman gave at Marsh Chapel there and took notes. And so, you know, the influence is enormous. Um, And then, of course, you have the incident that you spoke of, of him going to talk to him there. So uh, it's almost as if you don't have to be uh, a organizer. You don't necessarily have to be marching to have an extraordinary influence on something. Um, Because even in the training of some of the marchers, this idea of centering down, going inside and, you know, finding that place of peace before you go out, you know, and really trying to stay centered in that because you're going out to meet violent confrontation was very instrumental to that training process and to having people maintain a sense of composure when all of that was happening. Hmm. So uh, it it is. Um, I think it's amazing how the spirit works and and brings, you know, th- these events and people together in ways that we would have never thought could happen. Agreed. I I couldn't. That's so well said. To think about that centering down, that groundedness is the contemplative in the prophetic. It's the mystical activist. It's that pairing that is so needed to be able to make authentic change and transformation in the world. And I think that chapter in this book as a whole really speaks to that in a way that uh, this this whole-bodied life 
of doing what is yours to do, but also the ripple effects of what does it mean to be a part of, I love the old language, of the mystical body of Christ. What does that mean to be a part of it? I may just be a pinky, but that pinky offers some, ba- or some balance or some, uh, uh, some stability in a way that I might not be able to see. And I feel like that story just speaks to the, you take that one meeting and you go back uh, and you ripple through the future and you go back to you know, the roommates of Alberta King and Sue Bailey Thurman. Like that, It's incredible. And the level of trust to look at life in that way is, I think, is remarkable. Well, and then, of course, you know, we have this opportunity to talk about inner authority, capital I, capital A. Mm-hmm. And you see that in the the event when uh, Dr. King is leading a group of people over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And he stops and he kneels down and prays. And he gets back up and turns everybody around. That is just such an extraordinary moment of contemplation meeting action. Because mm-hmm. apparently what he heard was not today. Um, and 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 one of the things that I wanted people to know in this book, besides the fact that the Spirit is available to all of us and wants to help us, is that uh, when we work in uh, concert with the Spirit, I think we can take things much further along than if we're trying to do it ourselves. Um, and, you know, I want to encourage young activists that – Cultivating a spiritual life of some of some kind is so important because otherwise it's not sustainable. You're going to get burned out. Um, and, so, and there's got to be some purpose, um, some some bigger purpose for your work besides the fact that you're you're upset and you know you want justice now. I mean, it's you know there's it, it's like and for Thurman, you know his, his idea was that. Um, there is a oneness to the universe, which includes us and nature and everything. And anything that is um, blocking that ability of the of, of us to kind of reconcile and come back together needs to be addressed, which is how he was able to then link mysticism with social change. So when you go inside to God, you should come up in community or oneness. Um, and uh, there should be some kind of stirring within you, like a moral stirring, to work on these areas where uh, things are not harmonious. They are not the ways in which certainly um, Thurman believed God created them to be. So he was, you know, he wasn't not just so focused. Um, you know, his attitude was that, Racial reconciliation is wonderful, but um, he he was not in it because it was the right thing to do. He knew that you could not have union with God without it. Mm -hmm. So it takes it to a whole nother level. You know, it's not just, you know, Thurman was never on the surface level. He was always, you know, much deeper than that. And so he was seeing a whole nother thing about, you know, trying to, for, trying to get us to return to the oneness, uh, was, which is what it was really about for him, as opposed to, you know, working out, you know, some particular issues in the United States. Yeah. It's much better yeah. than that. Yeah. I, well, that's one of the things I so appreciate about Howard Thurman is you could take anything on like the linear path of like issues, context of today, that he would also open up the trap door that would drop you in to making sure that you don't forget the depth dimension of what is the connection that, uh, for the overflowing that can have significant impact on the linear, on the moments, on the context, on struggles and issues at the moment that they both matter. And uh, I so appreciate the way that just exudes in your book. Um, there was one piece uh, I was really struck by towards the end on uh, working paper. I wonder if you could, you could explain that concept. And then I would ask you, do you have a working paper? Well, uh, let's just say I haven't reviewed mine recently. But so uh, Roman introduces this concept in uh, his book, Deep is the Hunger. And he suggests that every person should have a working paper. Uh, you know, some ideas about how they are living. And, uh, you know, he was one to 
<laughs> especially those people that were, you know, uh, working in the civil rights movement who would come for him for, you know, counsel and advice. He would ask them the deep questions like, who are you? And what do you want really? Uh, and so he sort of felt like you need to be thinking about why are you here? Mm-hmm. And what is your purpose? Um, you know, uh, and who, you know, how, how do you know who you are and where did that come from? So he really felt like every person should have a working paper, you know, with a few questions that they needed to answer of themselves on it. Um, and that, uh, you, you needed to revisit it from time to time, revise it, he said, um, to consider the changing conditions as well as other people. Um, so, for example, uh, and, and, and I have to, uh, to uh, give credit to uh, Professor Greg Ellison, who's at Emory in the School of Theology, who wrote a lovely paper on the working paper. Um, and basically, and this is such a great example, you know, he, he achieved tenure and then it was kind of like, then what? (laughs) Right. (laughs) And it was almost as if he was sort of going through, he realized he was going through the motions, um, of a person who had just been kind of, uh, 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 you know, had, had just kind of jumped into the, the sort of sea of uh, regularity. So, you know, you get tenure and then I guess you write another book so you can get promoted to, you know, a full professor. And he had to stop. And so then uh, as he was uh, thinking and searching about this, uh, he contacted uh, Walter Fluker, who is uh, one of the preeminent Thurman scholars, and said, Mm Um, I noticed that in this book, he mentions working paper. Do you know of? And so it was some unpublished paper um, that listed kind of the questions that a person would ask, you know, if they were putting together their own working paper. But um, I, 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 I started my working paper and I, I, I must admit that I have not looked at it recently. This has been the year of book release and promotion. Yeah. So I'm trying to keep up with my life, but but I, I, but you know, I am aware that, for example, um, one of the things I know I'm here is to, as I, you know, people have repeated back to me, you know, to mid, midwife the spirit in other people, to really, to really help people understand that they're walking around with all the spiritual resources that they need, um, and it's really a matter of um, devoting themselves. Um, uh, to listening um, and paying attention to where it is that the spirit is guiding them. Um, in other other uh, places, I might call it a GPS, God's positional system. We have it, um, but oftentimes we're not paying attention to it, or we're not interacting with it, or we're not. You know, we may hear the guidance but not follow it or trust it. Um, <clears throat> and, and of course, I think. Part of the issue as well is that as you go along this sort of uh, path of listening, trusting, having some sense of patience, there's also the surrender at the end. And most people don't want to surrender. And and, and Thurman said, you know, a true mystic is a person who has yield, yielded their nerve center to God. Mm. So even in the day-to-day um like and I, I mentioned this earlier, uh, I probably need. I know I need to go sit for a few minutes at the end of the day, but what am I doing? I'm doing one more thing before I go to bed, right? So I hear the guidance, <laughs> but I'm doing something else. So, so you know, it's it's really a matter of I think awareness and practice. Oh, wow. Well, thank you for sharing that and for your vulnerability. And and how you're still working in the working paper. I was very inspired yeah. to 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 approach that in the coming days because I think what a lovely centerpiece to be able to kind of wrestle with uh, as one discerns next steps or their own vocational call and place in life. So I first again I want to thank you so much for your time and presence today, Professor Brown, and also for writing this marvelous book. 
that makes Howard Thurman come alive in our times again uh, through his eternal wisdom of what makes you come alive, a spiritual walk with Howard Thurman. Uh, Professor Brown, I always like to close these conversations by asking uh, a question of embodiment of if you were going to pair our conversation with any drink, anything from water to whiskey, what would go well with a conversation on your book on Howard Thurman, What Makes You Come Alive? Well, of course, you know, I don't drink alcohol for a variety of reasons, Mm -hmm. but um, I think... A good mojito. I like the sound of that. There's something very, you know, like with some fresh mint and, you know, the whole, the whole nine yards. I, 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 you know, it's, it's kind of like, it reminds you of, um, of being outside and being alive. Right. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that was the first thing that came to mind. Uh, a, a good mojito. <laughs> Professor Brown, I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Contemplify. May it refresh you and be a contemplative refuge. And perhaps maybe a moment or two will walk with you along the rest of your day. You can slide over to contemplify.com to find the show notes for this episode, including links to the resources mentioned in this conversation. And while you're there, you can also sign up for the monthly Contemplify non-required reading list, which I tee up with a contemplative musing then reflect on a few books that have come across my desk and wink at the art and articles stilling my soul. If you're enjoying Contemplify, please rate and review it on your podcast player. The internet's a huge place. This helps spread the contemplative cheer. The theme song for Contemplify is called Langside by Charles Enns and Darren Hovius. Fellas, thanks as always. For season four of Contemplify, I want to offer a nod. This is not an ad, but a nod of appreciation. This nod goes out to the Center for Spiritual Imagination. The Center for Spiritual Imagination exists to deepen and enrich human relationships with God, self, and neighbor in new and ancient ways. I can say with certainty that some of you listening, the offerings from the Center for Spiritual Imagination are exactly what you have been longing for. Check it out at spiritualimagination.org. And as always, I'm looking forward to bringing you more musings and more conversations with contemplatives in the world here in the near future. Until then, be well.